starting into the third week of a sermon series called You Can't Handle This. And we've been looking at how important difficult times are to us because they keep us focused on God. Now, we're not saying that difficult times are, are fun or that, that God somehow brings pain into our lives on purpose to teach us a lesson, but simply that, that we do better in our spiritual lives when we choose to trust God. So these difficult times, when we go through them, they allow us to build our faith muscles. In fact, Jesus had his own battles through tough times, didn't he? Last week, we, we looked at Jesus and the, the hard choices that he had to make as he actually chose the more difficult road. Not, not for his sake, right? But, but for ours. And this is encouraging to us, isn't it? To see the love of God for us. His willingness to send his own son to go through difficult times so that we someday would no longer have to face tough times. This is our God. And sometimes when I think of the love of God, I can't help but think of the dog, Doug. You remember Doug, the dog from uh, the Disney Pixar movie, Up? Well, Doug was a dog who could speak because he had a voice-activated collar, and he was a little bit of an airhead. He, he always was getting distracted by squirrels, right? But that's just like any other dog. But one thing that Doug did really, really well was love. At one point in the movie, he said, I have just met you and I love you. He showed the undying devotion of dogs towards their masters, towards um, protecting and loving and even serving their masters, even while sometimes the masters are trying to push them away. And, and it really helped the characters in the movie his undying life, love for them so that they could actually accomplish their task, their mission. And no, God is not an overweight golden retriever. And no, we definitely aren't his masters, but, but knowing that we are loved and accepted and that God is with us as we see in Jesus, doesn't that help us endure hardship and, and pain and even suffering? It helps us to know that we are loved. No doubt about it. But if I were to be honest, the warm fuzzies really only help so far. Yes, I love that I'm loved. And, and I'm still going through difficult times. So there's still difficulty there. I need a little bit more help than just knowing that I'm loved or even knowing that I'm forgiven, as important as those are in my life. Aubrey Sampson wrote a book about lamenting and she opened up her book by, by sharing some of the difficult things that she had going on in her life. Her, her cousin had tragically died and her, she talked about her own battle to try to ignore the pain in this strange autoimmune disease that she really had no answers for in her own life. And then she even talked about the health problem, problems of her own son. Well, then she says this, I want to place my suffering in a vacuum-sealed container and hide it under the bed with my skinny jeans and, and old journals, things I'm desperate to ignore. But grief won't be contained. Grief won't stay hidden. Grief explodes. Now, can you relate to that? Maybe some of you are thinking, you know, I'm trying, Pastor. I, I hear what you're saying about hard times, and I'm trying to work through this, but I need a little bit more than just warm sentiments. And thankfully, as we're going to look at today, Jesus offers us much more than just warm fuzzies of love or even, even forgiveness as important, again, as, as these are. In fact, the love of God is so much deeper than the love of a dog <laughs> because especially these dogs that love when they don't even know. Think of Tim Keller's quote in his book about marriage to be loved but not known is comforting, but it's superficial. 
To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, hum humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and it fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. And this is really the beginning of our understanding of what I would call our gospel identity, who we are in Christ. Think about the transaction that's described in, in Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. It says, you see, at this, just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now think about this. This is not an uninformed love, a love for someone that God did not know. He knew exactly who we were, that we were broken, that we were messed up, that we were dirty. This was not God seeing us struggle through some difficult situation that was, was happening to us and deciding to reach down to help these, these good people. Even the worst of people have compassion on people going through times that, that really are no fault of their own. But we were in the miry muck, and it was self-inflicted miry muck. We deserved what we were going through. And Jesus, who had to go through a very difficult time of his own to even get involved in our situation, chose to reach down and help us out. Loved us where we were. The gospel story itself should help us shoulder some of the, the difficult times that we run across to some degree, right? No, God's love is just not a sentimental love. It, it's a love that brings us completely into a different scenario, a new identity in Christ, right into the family of God, a son, a daughter, not some broken, messed up thing. Woe is me, I'm nothing, a broken down peasant. And now I'm facing difficult times on top of that. No, Eeyore, you are a child of the king. And not just any king, the king of kings who knows exactly who you are, what you're going through, where you're at, what you're facing. He's with you. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 29? Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The love that God has for us is not a distant love. It's an intimate, very involved love. In fact, Paul uses a unique word to describe the change in our identity when we receive Christ. The Greek word that he uses is, is kataloge. We translate it as reconciliation in English. And the basic idea is that there's this change um, that, that doesn't otherwise happen. It's a restoring to a, a favorable status. And we can see it back in Romans 5, where we were just a moment ago. Verse 10, it says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him, there's the word, through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That's the word again. Reconciliation. Kentalage. In Greek social and political spheres at that time, this, this term kentalage was, was used to describe um, a restoration in relationships between individuals or groups or even nations. And in religious arenas, it was used to describe the restoration of relationships between gods and, and humans, restoring the favor of the gods. And we can see how that might work, right? But there's this huge distinction in the Hellenistic religion of the Greeks. Uh, it's always the human's responsibility to actually pursue the restoration of God's favor. They did all the crazy things that you might imagine that they were required to do to, to somehow find God's favor. And how did they know that all these crazy things worked? That they had found favor with God for real? 
Well, the difficulties that they were going through went away. And if they didn't go away, then they knew that they hadn't found God's favor. And in our culture, we see this very same thing. And our very desperate cries that we, we cry out to God for in, in these difficult times that we face. <laughs> oh God, please help me. If you can help me through this situation, <laughs> I promise, you know, we've done all these promises. Promise, I promise that I will follow you to the very end of my days. Desperate times do bring us back to God, don't they? How does the saying go? There, there aren't any atheists in foxholes, right? But desperate times do not fix bad theology. Do not fix uh, bad thoughts about God. This is so important for us to understand. In Christian theology, in all of Paul's writings, we are not the initiators of trying to find favor with God. God is always the reconciler. Those in need of reconciliation... <laughs> are always hostile human beings. That's us. And God reaches out to us first. He reaches out to us. This is the love of God. This is the good news. God is offering His favor to us. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. <laughs> All this is not from us. Not from our crazy stunts or sacrifices, but from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. We don't have to do the crazy things to earn God's favor. We were broken when, we, when, when he started the process, when he reached out to us, we weren't doing crazy things. God was doing the work for us through Christ. We simply have to receive it. It's by God's grace. It's his unmerited favor. I know this is so foreign to us, but it's true. This is the gospel. And we also have to change our minds on how we can tell if the transaction between us and God sticks. Our usual barometer, again, like everyone else, every religion probably known to man, um, is that good things would happen to us. That's how we know that we're in favor with God. Or at least that the bad things stop happening. But our favor with God in Christ is actually a change in identity. And, in, and it's not necessarily a change in circumstances. Look at Jesus, for instance. He, he probably had a good relationship with God, wouldn't you say? <laughs> And yet, difficult things still continue to happen in his life, right? Our change in identity, that's what matters. And this change in identity does not leave us unchanged in reality. With a restored relationship with God, he actually starts working in us and through us, shaping us and growing us, even, even through our sufferings. Back to Romans 5 one more time. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Praise the Lord. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is how transformation happens, isn't it? Standing in this access to God that we now have in faith, in His presence. God now working in us and through us. And, and the proof of God's favor? God's work in our life. That's what, what God's favor looks like. It's not a guarantee of smooth sailing. It has everything to do with changed hearts and changed character. And we, we should rejoice when we see this happening in our lives, when we see God transforming us in our hearts, whether we're going through difficult times or not. 
I think this is why Jesus can preach what he does in the Sermon on the Mount on Matthew chapter 5. Concepts so foreign to us, we just don't quite understand the blessings of God. Listen to what Jesus says, beginning in verse 3 of Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <laughs> now how are these blessings? <laughs> are you seeing it? The blessings of God is us resembling more and more the ways of God. Not exemption from hard times, but actually God working in our lives, transforming us. <laughs> our change in our in identity, our change in our heart. And just as last week we talked about Jesus' willingness to, to take on the harder path and that that somehow created an expectation upon his followers to do the same, to choose the more difficult path, not for themselves, but, but for those around them, so this change in our identity, this reconciliation, brings an expectation towards the followers of God as well. Continuing on in 2 Corinthians 5, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see what's happening here? God does not show us his amazing grace and his mercy and his love and, and reconcile us to him so that we could somehow endure hard times. Our lives have so much greater purpose because of our new identity. It's, it's just so much more than just survival. Remember these our human concerns, survival, self-preservation. We now have the freedom in Christ to take on God's concerns to help people find God's desire for reconciliation, to be those who represent the righteousness of God, who, who show how great God's ways really are. Do you see the difference? The religion of Jesus' day was not very much different than the religion that we see today in our world. Their focus is completely on legalism, trying to follow all the rules. Why? Because they're trying to earn the favor of God. Life in Christ, though, it's just the total opposite of that. Because, because of Christ, we are already restored. We have been reconciled. And, and so we are past trying to please God and we have now been moved to joining the team. Praise the Lord. And what is God about? <laughs> well, we've been looking at this the last couple of weeks. God is about whatever it takes to rescue, whatever it takes to help, whatever it takes to bless others. We're no longer focused on us, but on them. This is the message of the gospel. In Christ, we can somehow get past our internal focus on our troubles and, and instead take on the concerns of God. And yes, even this we can't handle on our own. <laughs> it's God's transforming work in us that helps transform our hearts and create this new identity in us. So what does this look like in your life? Where is your focus? Is your focus on all the difficulties that are going on in your life? On earning God's favor, maybe? Or maybe instead, trusting into this new identity that you have in Christ. How does your new identity in Christ play into your life? Or does it? 
Maybe that's a better question. Are you seeing your heart and your life be transformed as you invest in the things of God? Which, by the way, are the people around you. Or are you just too busy looking at all the troubles coming into your life that you just are distracted? One last reminder of what our new life looks like in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So let's choose to fix our eyes on Jesus by committing to do the things that he's calling us to do. Prayer, which means spending time in his presence. Uh, reading his word, being with the body of Christ regularly, which in this time might be on the phone or online, finding ways to connect with other believers, and then submitting to God's will for our lives. And that includes coming alongside of others and their difficulties and offering them the hope that we have in Christ. And, and offer, that offering doesn't just come through words. It comes through actions. It comes through our own attitudes as they observe us going through our own difficulties, right? They can see the hope in us as we trust in Christ. Can we allow God to help us in this? Would you pray with me? Lord God, you are such an amazing God. <laughs> and your word is, is so amazing in teaching us. Lord God, we are so thankful that your love is not some distant love, but very much engaged, involved in our lives, that you are interested in what's happening to us. And, and as we engage and are reconciled to you, we, we find that we have transformation happening in and through us as your Spirit works in our lives. And Lord, we rejoice when we see that in our lives. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on what you're doing in our hearts, in our character, in our witness, and not just on the troubles that we see around us. Help us to trust in you. Give us strength in these difficult times to, to keep our eyes on you, Lord. And we will give you all the praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Let's just close our, our service this morning by by remembering the words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. People of God, we are a blessed people, aren't we? to have an opportunity to stand in the presence of God. Giving us the, he's given us that type of access to his strength, his love, his transformation in our lives. As we go into the world this week, would you choose to act <laughs> as if you are blessed? Let's keep our eyes on Jesus, shall we? You are sent.